Siblings and sisters and brothers in Christ, welcome to Tuesdays for Nurture. Tuesdays for Nurture is a webinar series every Tuesday where we faithfully focus on education for the people of God. We talk about faith-filled politics, interviews of key leaders, how-tos in congregational life, and the impacts of current realities on the life of the church. And every webinar includes clear suggestions about what you can do to change the church and the world closer to the world that God imagines for all of us. So today, we're going to talk together about church-based reparations. And I I am so excited for this conversation after first having learned about this through the work of Jennifer Harvey and Dear White Christians to see this in action and to witness and learn it and learn from all the folks in the process about how we can do this together is so exciting for me. So without further ado, I want to introduce Reverend Timothy Tutt, who is the senior pastor at Westmoreland UCC in Maryland, and he will be hosting and facilitating this conversation alongside Reverend Morton Silver. So to you. Reverend Tim. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, as Chris said, I'm the senior minister at Westmoreland Congregational United Church of Christ. Um, we're located on Piscataway land in Bethesda, Maryland, literally just across the street from our nation's capital, just across the street from Washington, D.C. But our congregation, like many UCC congregations and many congregations from various denominations, um, and traditions has been exploring what reparations might look like for us as a local congregation and how we might do that in partnership with our other um, close nearby UCC congregations. Um, there is, as, as Chris said, a growing call among many um, religious groups in the country to explore financial reparations as a part of making amends uh, through monetary payments, through financial investments, and long-term programs benefiting African Americans. And so I'm so grateful for this conversation today. I am here as a learner in this conversation. I'm here to learn uh, personally and to learn how my congregation might engage this more fully. I'm so grateful for the others who are taking part, who will share their wisdom and their learning and their experiences, maybe their mistakes. Um, this can be a messy process. Um, learn their suggestions as well for next steps and practices for engaging this work. And so um, welcome uh, to my conversation partners. This is an ecumenical conversation. Um, there's much interest among us in the UCC um, about reparations, but we are not alone. And so I'm grateful that we'll have a conversation with the rector of an Episcopal church, staff member at a Presbyterian seminary, and one of our own uh, UCC conference ministers. Um, before I introduce the conversation partners, I also want to say thanks um, to all of the people in the UCC National Office who work behind the scenes to make these webinars happen. Thank you, Chris and Jennifer. Thank you, Laurel, Roberto, and, and others um, who are doing such good work to keep us connected um, as we're all at home. Thanks so much uh, for that. Um, so our conversation partners today, first, Reverend Gray Maggiano, the Rector of Memorial Episcopal Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Memorial Episcopal Church recently announced that as a congregation, they will designate $500,000 over the next five years to establish a fund intended as reparations for slavery. And so welcome, Gray, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Timothy. It's great to be with you all. Um, our second conversation partner is Sushama Austin Connor. Um, Sushama is the program director of the Black Theology and Leadership Institute at Princeton Theological Seminary in New Jersey, um, as well as being the program administrator for the Continuing Education and Center uh, Program Administrator for Continuing Education for the Center of Black Church Studies. Um, lots uh, going on there in her job description. But in October of 2019, Princeton Seminary, which is affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA, pledged to spend $28 million on reparations um, over the seminary's ties to slavery. Um, and so Sushama, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Tim. I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Tim said, my name is Sushama Austin Connor. Thanks so much. Glad you're here. And our next conversation partner, Reverend Sherry Prestemann, is the conference minister um, of the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ. In 2019, the Minnesota Conference voted to begin a process of reparations. They passed a resolution that recognizes the pervasive sin of racism. 
Uh, that resolution apologizes for past actions of Christians and the Christian church in the history of slavery and genocidal abuse of native people and communities and the subsequent institutional racism and laws and practices of our state and country. And that resolution also created a reparations fund. Um, the conference put some seed money into that and has invited local churches to join in that as well. And so welcome to you, Sherry, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate the invitation. I'm glad to be here to learn among you. Thanks. And also joining us in this conversation is Reverend Marvin Silver. Marvin is Associate Conference Minister for the Central Atlantic Conference. Um, Reverend Silver is working with churches on various anti-racist and racial justice initiatives and has been in conversation with me and my congregation and other churches um, here in the DC area in particular about reparations. So welcome Marvin and thank you for being here. Pastor Tim, I'm glad to be here with you to continue this work. And I, I don't want to speak uh, for you, Marvin, but I think that you and I and, and the people of Westmoreland Church and other local congregations here um, in, in our city are in the early stages of exploring um, congregation-based reparations. And so this conversation will give Marvin and me a chance to ask some questions. We're going to sort of moderate or facilitate um, by uh, engaging with these other conversation partners, learning from these other these others who are uh, maybe a step or two along the way ahead of us. Um, but we hope this will be a time of learning for all of us in these various settings of the church. Um, and so to begin, great, let me let me. And turn. I just want to make sure that we introduce everyone who is here. So Bishop Scarf has joined us as well. Uh, from the Bishop of the Diocese of uh, Episcopal Diocese of Iowa. And I, I do have a feeling like I walked into the wrong Zoom room. Um, but uh, we are, we have a task force on reparations and uh, are just beginning uh, that journey and exploration. And so we're, I'm certainly here as a learner uh, more than anything else, I think. So glad to be with you and thank you for the invitation. Thank you and, and welcome. And at, at a point, we'll open up the conversation and certainly um, your wisdom and your questions uh, will be most welcome when, when we hear from these three and see how we all engage with this at different levels. So thank you and welcome. It's also just great to see so many people joining from around the country. Um, but great to, to begin with, with your congregation, with Memorial Episcopal Church in Baltimore, um, a congregation founded by slave owners. Um, if, if you'd start with just a little bit of the history of the church so that we can get a flavor for, for that particular place. Um, and then um, moving from that history, how did you actually begin the conversation about reparations? Thanks, Timothy. Uh, and I'll uh, get to the history in just a moment, but I do want to say that even though I'm an Episcopalian, I do have some UCC connection. My first paid church job was at First Congregational Church in Williamstown, Massachusetts. I saw some folks from Williamstown on the chat. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, for getting me my start in ministry and, uh, and looking forward to, to the conversation today. Uh, you know, I think the Memorial Episcopal Church uh, was founded in 1860. We were a plant of another church here in Baltimore, Emmanuel Episcopal Church, that was founded a few years before that. This was part of a, a rapid expansion of church planting here in the city as Baltimore expanded uh, relatively rapidly in the, the early half of the 1800s. And the church was founded by, uh, it was a memorial to a rector who had just died, Henry Van Dyke Johns. Uh, his brother was the Bishop of Virginia, John Johns. And it was founded by Charles Ridgely Howard, uh, who was of the Howard family of Maryland, uh, how, where we got the name Howard County. Uh, and John Eager Howard, who was a Revolutionary War uh, hero, was the, uh, the sort of patriarch of that family. And uh, so Charles G. Howard was the founder of the church, but he died uh, two years into building the church during the middle of the Civil War. And so the church became a memorial to both Howard and John's. Uh, but his Charles Ridgely Howard's wife was active in the parish amazingly till the 1920s. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the math on that one. And uh, his, his family were involved in, in funding uh, the initial construction of the church as well. So the, um, 
memorial, like like many churches uh, on in border states, uh, and was very tied to the Confederacy. Of the first nine rectors, eight of them served in the Confederacy or or openly supported the Confederacy. Uh, Baltimore and the neighborhood that we are in here, Bolton Hill, became a refuge for Southerners after the Civil War. Uh, they uh, they. Uh, came up here after they sold what they could from plantations and other homes and, and bought homes here in the community. So uh, you would, it was not uncommon to come to Memorial in the later half of the 1800s and find Stonewall Jackson's widow in the pews, um, other you know, uh, heroes and dignitaries from the, the, the Confederacy serving in the church. Uh, uh, Robert E. Lee's aide de camp lived half a block down uh, the street and was was active in the parish as well, so you just had a general uh, support, you know, general support for the Confederacy uh, here in the in the community, and and so we we sort of knew that history, and but we didn't know really anything from then until the 1960s about our own story, and we didn't know very much about the 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 slave holding interests of, of, of any of the founders. And the Diocese of Maryland instituted a program called the Trail of Souls, where they encouraged churches to uh, look at their own history around slavery and the legacy of slavery. And when we say legacy of slavery, we're talking about everything that happened after 1865, recognizing that, you know, slavery didn't, racism didn't mag magically stop uh, in, in 1865, but there were various permutations of how slavery continued in one way or another um, up until the present day with the prison industrial complex. So we were encouraged to look at our history and uh, did a, a first glance uh, before I got here. And it, that was basically what I had have just told you. But uh, when I arrived at Memorial in 2016, it was right after uh, um, Freddie Gray was killed by the Baltimore City Police here in the city, and that uh, that there was a real reconciling going on across the city uh, around issues of race and racism. So we began to dig a little deeper and ask the question of, you know, in, in a city that is 70% African American, in a uh, neighborhood that's 50% African American, how can this church possibly be 95% white? Uh, and so, you know, to, to answer your question about sort of how we got started, um, I am always uh, my grandmother's son, and she reminded me to accentuate the positive. Uh, so the first thing we did was we talked about good things, right? We looked at the last 50 years. We knew that this church was extremely active in justice issues from uh, the Vietnam War on to the present day. And so we did a, a oral history of we interviewed everyone in the parish about their feelings around justice, how they associated memorial with social justice and, and what that, that looked like for them. And so we got these beautiful stories of, you know, parishioners, uh, you know, carrying Black Panther activists in the trunk of their cars around the city uh, in the late 60s, early 70s to avoid police lockups. Uh, the, the stories of, uh, you know, the Berrigan brothers scrubbing the floors in the parish hall after they had, you know, Catholic Peace Worker Movement events of, you know, the first AIDS uh, services and first, first AIDS clinics here at Memorial, when really all you could do was pray with people. Um, the ways large and small that this served as a refuge for uh, people who were sort of on the outskirts of society. All, and then, you know, we were the first church to have a, a female clergy, Episcopal clergy, uh, first church to have uh, a, a celebration of a gay marriage. Uh, way back in the 80s before that was a thing, uh, and the first church to have an openly uh, gay priest. So we had all this great history that we celebrated. And then we kind of said, okay, what, what happened before that? Um, and we talked, and so we kind of, we started working backwards from 1969 um, when the, 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 the style of, the, when the church changed all the way back to its founding. And we discovered that uh, there was a whole host of things that we had been lying to ourselves about. Um, there was a priest that was fired in the 1950s 
And the, the report that I got when I first got here was, well, you know, he just wanted to invite these West Virginia coal miners to church and, you know, the, the uppity high society Episcopalians wouldn't allow it. Uh, but that wasn't the case at all. It was, it was purely about race, that they, he was seeking to integrate the parish. Uh, the parish said no. The bishop took the bar- parish's side. And so uh, the, the priest was forced out uh, to, to leave along with his associate. And one of the, so one of the first reconciling things that happened in our community was actually between Memorial and that priest's family, uh, who they still tell the story in the way it happened and have always been uh, saddened and embarrassed that Memorial has never acknowledged it. So um, that was sort of the first piece of reconciliation uh, that, that happened. And then we went back further and realized there was a youth center that we used to operate that when it was suggested we integrate it, we forced it to close rather than that integrate the youth center. Um, And we kind of kept kept going back and the stories got worse and worse and worse in our our legacy. And and frankly, I think it sort of stalled. People got really tired of of all this kind of negative talk uh, until our deacon, who's an African-American woman who grew up here in Baltimore, discovered that her family had been enslaved at Hampton Plantation, which is a large plantation home outside of the city and that the founding, the family who, who enslaved her family was the Ridgely Howard family, uh, the family that uh, founded our church. And that, I think just, oh, at that point, everyone knew we had to do something. And so that's what really brought us to, to the present day. Thanks for that. Thanks for uh, the reminder to acknowledge our story, right? To be honest with ourselves about who we are. Um, I, I like your grandmother's approach of start with the positive, but I also like this, this idea of digging deeper to, to remind ourselves of, of who we really are. So you all have, have opted or, or have decided to set aside $500,000, which is a significant amount of money. Um, how did you decide where that money will go? Um, so we, um, we, we spent a lot of time, uh, I think, th- so I'll step back and say that there was a lot of energy probably two years ago to do reparations right away. And we had a facilitator at a retreat who basically said, if you, if you do it now, it's just going to be your white guilt and you're not going to actually repair or restore any relationship. Uh, so if you want to give money, give money, but don't don't call it reparations until you're ready to repair something. Uh, so the, we spent another two years kind of asking that question, like what, what would we do? And we really recognized that, uh, that, the, that the founders of the church had done tremendous damage in four areas based on our research, which was housing, uh, voter engagement, voter rights, uh, um, the environment and education. And that we can use those, you know, use those four things to drive our work forward and looking for you know, black led organizations in our zip code or close enough that are doing work in those areas that we can support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, the idea of, of predominantly white congregations making sure not just to partner with, but to, but to take the lead from black led organizations. Yeah. That's really important. So thanks for that. Um, let's bring Sushama Austin Connor into the conversation now. Sushama um, uh, on the staff at Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, Princeton, as we said, uh, their board of trustees decided to set aside $28 million um, a couple of years ago for reparations. Um, Sushama, uh, not that you have to speak for the entire seminary, but would you like to talk us through a little bit of, of that process? Absolutely. And I'm glad that you prefaced it that way, because I I certainly am not speaking for the entire um, seminary. Um, And I'm also um, cognizant of the fact that I want you all to know that I was not actually on the committee that wrote the report, but have been a part of the multiple conversations that have happened um, around the report. Before I just um, share a little bit about the report, I just want to say um, how grateful I am to be here, but really to be a part of the United Church of Christ as my personal home denomination. Um, I am in care in the New Jersey Association. I am uh, I was 
born UCC. Um, and, you know, my parents made a motivated and intentional decision for our family to be a part of a social justice oriented denomination. So, you know, I'm here on the backs of a wonderful church in Washington, D.C., People's Congregational Church. Um, a. Knight and Stanley was a the pastor there. So I, I say that to honor um, being here with my, my peeps, with my denomination and with people who um, I, I admire greatly. So I would say I would start there, right? <laughs> See, Chris, yeah. So that I would definitely start there. Um, I have been at Princeton Theological Seminary um, for about 10 years now. So enough to have a trajectory to um, be able to share with you all that this conversation about reparations. So um, Shusama, I, your, your volume has declined. I don't know, can the rest of you hear her okay? Is this better? Chris, any, any advice from behind the scenes about, um, just, just keep going, going? just keep okay. going. Yeah, keep, keep going. going. All right, I'll turn it up a little bit. So I was um, starting to say that I have been at the seminary for about 10 years and um, enough to kind of see a trajectory of this conversation. The conversation about reparations, whatever we want to um, call it, you know, has been at least, at least since I've been there the entire time. And I know there were conversations before that. The crux of the conversation um, has happened in I'd say somewhere in the 2014, 15 to today range. Um, but I know for a fact that it was happening before. So I wanna stress that. I'm gonna talk about from spring uh, 2016 when our president Craig Barnes um, commissioned a committee that consisted of faculty, students and alumni and administrators. Um, to examine um, PTS's ties to slavery. So we'll start there um, with this convening that started in spring 2016. So in a sense, that's not quite so long ago. You know, it's just a couple of years ago that the intention and the need to say, okay, we, we have to do something and, um, and we have to talk about this and um, deal with this and convene it in an intentional and serious manner. Um, what was uncovered in that audit, and there, there are many things, and I'm going to pop the, um, the um, report website into the chat, but I'll highlight a couple. One is that, yes, the seminary founders had ties to slavery. Um, in, in the report, the language is um, discussed as direct and indirect. Um, for me personally, you know, indirect, direct, the, the terms, what do they mean in, in the sense that slavery is slavery? And so, but, but we are talking about some indirect and some direct ties to slavery. Um, and we know that these ties um, shaped theological study um, and they shape basically the mission of the seminary and the church. So we need to be aware of that. Um, it uncovered that the seminary did in fact benefit from the slave economy. Um, it benefited um, through economic sources, including investments in um, Southern banks that finance buildings on our campus. So we, that's a fact. And another thing to highlight is, um, and, the, and the report gives a lot of attention to this, but the participation of early founders, faculty and board members in an organization called the American Colonization Society. Um, and that was a group that pushed to have freed slaves sent back to Liberia in Africa. Um, and this, I think, is, is like a little asterisk for me interested in history, too. That group existed until 1964. <laughs> so um, 10 years before I was born. So again, we are, we are talking about incredibly recent history. To further in the timeline of, of this, so spring 2016, PTS is um, commissioning this report and finds these findings of which I just highlighted um, three or four. In March 2019, the Association of Black Seminarians, um, who are basically that our students, our Black seminarians, released a petition. Um, that petition, as of an hour before this um, session I checked, it had over 700 signatures. So they released a petition in March 2019, laying out a series of their own recommendations 
um, that they have um, compiled talking to alum, black alum through the years, black faculty, um, and having many of those folks sign on to it. Again, they have allowed for several recommendations. I'll highlight the one that I think it probably was the most pressing and, and the one that they were probably the most disappointed did not happen, which is to call for no less than 15% of the seminary's income, which would be roughly about $5 million a year. So that's March, 2019. In October 2019, the Board of Trustees takes into consideration all of the recommendations of the Association of Black Seminarians, all of um, our own you know, recommendations from the original commissioning, the conversations that happens with, with faculty and staff and folks from, from, those, from that year, and they unanimously adopt a multi-year plan of their own, taking into everyone's you know, ideas about it, but they develop their own plan um, to repent for the seminary's relationship to slavery. And they commit to a tangible action plan um, to shape the PTS community going forward. I will run through again, it is so dense and so robust and, and really well done, but I will highlight just a couple so that um, we, so that I can share the, basically the extent of it. Um, so the highlights from the action plan that were approved, um, one, it, they were approved over a five-year period, so from um, from to through 2024. Um, COVID has changed all of our lives, but COVID has changed a few of those dates. But we're still aiming for this to roll out over five years through 2024. We saw a 27 million dollar pledge, um, one million a year, and the rest set aside from the endowment an increase in investment in the Center for Black Church Studies, which would mean hiring a full-time director, um, greatly um, funding it in, in tremendous ways. I am actually um, half my job. I know Tim read off like eight of my jobs, but half of one of my jobs is at the Center for Black Church Studies. So that's very good news for us. Um, it involved renaming the center for Betsy Stockton. Well, Betsy Stockton was a former slave um, in the household of the first chair of the seminary board. Um, so Betsy Stockton will be, it will be the Center for Black Church Studies, the Black, the, I'm sorry, the Betsy Stockton Center for Black Church Studies. Um, in addition to that, changes in the seminary curriculum, we are in the early stages of a multi-year plan to look at the seminary, um, to look at, wrap it up, Okay, yeah, so, well, there's so many and I'll pop it in the chat, but I will say, let me just say quickly, um, doctoral fellowships and 30 new scholarships for entering students, um, um, including descendants of slaves. And I saw someone ask about Native Americans in the chat. It would be for descendants of slaves and all underrepresented groups. And then I, I have to say this one and then I'm gonna stop. The library itself, Princeton Seminary's enormous and powerful and amazing um, library will be now named the Theodore Cedric Wright Library. So that's huge. I could go on and on, but I won't. Um, and I'll pop some of the report findings in the chat and I'm happy to answer more questions. I, I think um, what I'm learning is that these are long conversations and long important conversations. conversations. Yeah. But thank you, I, I want to say thank you um, for highlighting the voice of uh, the African American students who who were influential there, yes. um, and also for letting us know the very specific things that Princeton's plan is is to fund some very specific programs that will then move the seminary forward, and we'll come back to all of this in a minute. Um, let's um, let's invite Marvin Silver and Sherry Preston into the conversation um, at the conference level, and after they've had a, a bit of conversation, want to invite. Um, Bishop Scarf into the conversation as, as well. But Marvin and, and Sherry, tell us, uh, or lead us a little bit through some conference decisions. Sure, sure. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Uh, thank you, Reverend Prestamon, for your time to come and talk about what has been happening in the Minnesota conference. As you, you know, there's a lot of great racial justice work happening across the United Church of Christ at the conference level. Why don't you take a little, little, little bit of time here and talk about how the conference came to this decision to work on reparations and what was your process? Thanks, Marvin. And I first wanna say how humbled I am to be on this panel, particularly alongside the two examples that we've just been hearing about. 
which are so bold and generous. Um, by comparison, the Minnesota Conference UCC, we are on the path and I'm grateful for that. And uh, I cannot offer such bold numbers to you today. Um, but how did we begin? Um, I, I would point to three different points in our fairly recent history. One, um, ironically, Chris mentioned uh, Jennifer Harvey, Dr. Jennifer Harvey in her introduction, and that was really the beginning for us. Several years ago, Dr. Harvey was our keynote speaker at our annual meeting. And um, she led us through a conversation about reparations that was accessible to everyone in our conference, which has, um, you know, small cities, big cities, and very rural settings all and is primarily of European descent, she led us through that conversation in a way that cracked it open for us and made it possible for us to enter in um, and go a little bit more into deeper water. So that was the beginning. We digested that and continued to talk about that in the life of the conference. And then in 2019, we passed a resolution brought by our racial justice team to our annual meeting, which uh, very clearly called us to the work of reparations, including starting seeding a small fund uh, for financial reparations, but also inviting us to think not only as a conference, but also our local churches um, to think more broadly about rep what reparations might look like in our life together. So that was in 2019. In 2020, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. And that, uh, you know, I mean, that, um, that kicked us into an accelerated mode. Um, we, we were on the path already, but that event and that injustice once again, opened up the entire conversation and gave it a different urgency than we had felt prior. Um, so since then, we've been putting flesh on the resolution and putting flesh on our commitment in this way. Great, and um, talk a little bit about some of the, the lessons. Again, our, our whole conversation today is about sharing the lessons uh, so that as we talk about this across the, the church, uh, we can begin to uh, not start from scratch, uh, but build off of uh, others' great work. So talk a little bit about some of the lessons that uh, you have learned as a conference minister and what you've seen happening in the conference. And then uh, a little bit about uh, how, much you're, how, how, how much is the local churches uh, engaged in, in this work? Well, one of the lessons for us is um, that we have to provide ways for everyone across the life of our conference in very different settings and with very different perspectives on this issue, we have to provide a way for each to enter in to the conversation in a way that makes sense for them. Um, so that's the first lesson. The second is um, we, as I said, are a predominantly white conference we do not have a lot of persons of color around our tables. Uh, we have one congregation that is of Native American uh, background. We have another small congregation that is predominantly African American. And then of course we have some diversity within other congregations that are predominantly white. So what we are learning is that we have to be very, very intentional about creating space at the table for voices and experiences that are not necessarily in our congregations or automatically at our tables of conversation. Um, we, you know, we've entered into some decision-making processes, processes around these questions and have learned on the backside um, that we should have invited in um, voices uh, from communities of color and did not do that. So we've learned that um, the hard way. I'd say the last thing we've learned and we've really internalized this is that um, we have to be very willing to be vulnerable and to take risks. 
Um, we've made mistakes already on this journey. I can name one, you know, very transparently, one that I would name is that our conference recently sold our camp property. And we did discuss as part of that decision-making process, whether or not we should give that land back to the tribe, native tribe. We chose not to do that. We chose instead to sell the camp and utilize a portion of the proceeds for the purpose of reparations, in part because when we look at reparations, we're conscious that we want to include African American communities and Native American communities, especially important in Minnesota for us. Um, but there was some pain around that decision that we did not decide to give the land back to indigenous peoples. And we had to um, make space for that pain and for that um, disappointment in us from some of our dear partners who were not UCC, but um, with whom we are partnered in the community and our Native American. And um, in fact, one of them, his name is Reverend Jim Baird Jacobs. He's very involved in uh, Minnesota Council of Churches work in Minnesota. He said once in a separate event, he said, um, you know, white folks need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I have remembered that and uh, lived into that uh, since hearing it, because that's the lesson that we are having to learn again and again and again. We have to be willing to take the risks, to go out on the edge, to mess up, hear from others how we messed up, learn from it, and be changed. But it's, it's vulnerable work. Well, thank you for... Uh your courage today to share uh, what's happening in the Minnesota conference. And thank you for your commitment to this important uh, work that's, that's taking place. I know that there are some other questions uh, coming from uh, our attendees. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Pastor Tim. Well, what I wanna do for just a second would be to invite Bishop Scarf into the conversation. Um, bishop Alan Scarf is the Bishop, the Episcopal Bishop of Iowa. So Sherry, he is your neighbor to the South, I believe if my uh, Midwestern geography is correct in the, in the heat of the moment. Um, but Bishop Scarf is here. Um, any comments about the work that, that the Episcopal churches um, in your diocese are doing that connect to what Sherry and Marvin or, or any of these others are talking about? Well, I think we're we're on this uh, in, on this panel because we're answering the question that's being raised. I think in many of the listeners and participants is, well, where do we begin? Uh, because that we're right at the beginning, and we're at the beginning in an environment in which you wouldn't imagine uh, that we would be um, sort of beginning to go down this road. Uh, we're predominantly um, Anglo con uh, congregations. We have one Native American congregation, indigenous congregation, and, and, and we, we have very uh, little, uh, I would say very little input uh, um, among African Americans within, within the, even within the Episcopal Church. So where are we, why are we at the beginning of this road? Well, it's because of many of the things that already have been said. We have uh, Jennifer Harvey in, in Drake, uh, she's right there. So we've got, we've had her come and talk with our clergy. Uh, we have an uh, exciting uh, presiding bishop in Michael Curry, who links uh, reconciliation, reparation, uh, and evangelism. Uh, we we have lots of reasons that have come up, and of course, then what happened last 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 summer with George Floyd and and the response and the Episcopal response in our diocese with all the, joining all of the, the protests and the, and so on was, was pretty high. But what came out of it all really um, from a group that has been formed called the Beloved Community Initiative, um, which uh, is a, a partnered ministry of the diocese uh, out of Iowa City um, and uh, works with the people of color in that, in that in the community um, as lead, not as um, being done for or anything like that. It's as being asking what, what is, what, where can we support one another? And out of that came a resolve by the Episcopal Diocese uh, at its last convention to use Epiphany 2021 through to Easter 2022 as a season of truth and healing. And part of that was an obligation on my part to raise up a task force 
um, on repar of re reparations task force, which I've appointed a, a, a diverse task force of about 15 to 16 people. And their job is first of all, to identify a working um, definition of reparation as we use it in the diocese identify and recommend changes that combat re systemic racism in the structure of the diocese at every level, review and share the history of Iowa's and our church's part in benefiting from the legacies of slavery and indigenous genocide and displacement. And one of our instruments for that is a tremendous digital creation, a history of race in Iowa. It's a digital map um, in which uh, we're placing uh, as the stories unfold, we're placing uh, the, these stories in, in their place where they are in their, in their timeline and so on within this, on this digital map that uh, can be viewed at the Beloved Community Initiatives website. And then we're exploring the ramifications of slavery and indigenous genocide and displacement, including the emotional, spiritual and psychological reparations, as well as examining how in terms of phys financial implications the Diocese of Iowa could join other Episcopal institutions that we know of, such as the Diocese of New York and Texas, Maryland, Virginia Seminary, who are all designing significant funds to provide for financial reparations in forms of uh, scholarships, housing, business, financial institutions, ownership by Black and Indigenous peoples. So we want to join in all of that. Um, and that's, that's, I suppose that's why I'm on this panel. <laughs> Uh, well, thank I, you. I did actually come in a wrong door. I came in as a, I came, I thought I was coming in as a participant and found myself on the panel. There's, there's no wrong door. I think, here, I think we're here to let you know, you can always begin somewhere. There's, and, there's no wrong door to a conversation such as this. Um, I, I grew up a Baptist and went to a Baptist seminary and, um, Remember, um, I think it's uh, Dr. McClendon, James William McClendon's comments about baptism, whether baptism by immersion or baptism by sprinkling were better. And he said, we're all going to the same party. We just get there through different doors. So we're glad that you are, you're here. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, thanks for, for detailing some of those specific steps that you've taken and also for talking about this important step of telling our stories honestly and, and truthfully. Um, I think there are resources to be shared between denominations. I'm, I'm glad uh, John Dorhauer is here with us and others. I think um, we don't need to do this in our silos as we think about this important work because it's not for us as denominations or local congregations, but for the nation and, and the world as a whole. So thank you for, for being a partner on the journey. Um, I'm, I, I want to go back to Gray for just a moment. Um, Gray, in the conversation, um, uh, Jennifer Harvey's book, Dear White Christians, has come up a couple of times. Um, obviously, Ta-Nehisi Coates' piece in The Atlantic about reparations is really important, uh, a good read. And then Kelly Brown Douglas's article in Sojourners, um, maybe less than a year ago, about um, the case for church-based reparations is an important resource. Um, but I'm wondering if your congregation did, are there any resources that you would recommend? A lot of what I'm hearing is that we're all starting on this journey. Many of us are just starting out. What resources do you have from your experience? Uh, you know, certainly all, all three of those texts are great. Uh, I see Austin Channing Brown's I'm Still Here in the chat. That was a, an important reference for us, uh, as well as uh, uh, Ibram Kendi's work. Uh, and Kelly Brown Ducks, Douglas's book, uh, you know, on, on black bodies. Uh, also, there's a, another book out uh, called, by Jamar Tis, Tisby called The Color of Compromise. And it is about is the role that white churches played in segregation. Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in uh, churches dealing not just with slavery per se, but everything that came after. Uh, you know, that, that legacy of slavery and, and the, the Tisby book gets into that and, and does not pull any punches in terms of, of pointing out, uh, you know, how each church is, is in many ways connected to this story. If you're in a church that was founded uh, in the 1920s, you're almost assuredly a white flight congregation from somewhere else. If you're founded in the 1970s, you're a white flight congregation from somewhere else. Uh, you, you have a connection to this story. If you're if everyone in, in, in your church or most people in your church are white and look like you, you are connected uh, to the story and, and have some, some truth telling to, to do. 
Thanks. Uh, Marvin, let me, let me uh, invite you to unmute if you want to. Anything that you want to ask these panelists? Uh, Reverend Silver, any questions that have popped up for you as you've heard them talk? Um, I would say one in particular for, for Gray uh, and Sue, uh, Sushima in particular with the financial reparations. Um, how, what's been, I guess, the public response to these announcements? And uh, what are some of the, I guess, uh, uh, other ways in which the monies are uh, scheduled to be uh, spent, especially for you, Gray. I don't think I heard that in particular. Uh, I'll answer briefly and then in, in, invite Shashama to tell Princeton's story, which is in many ways much more exciting than ours. Uh, but, you know, so the, the first thing I did after we made the announcement and it kind of uh, went viral locally in Baltimore was to call all of the, the local uh, black organizers here in, in West Baltimore and get a sense for how it was resonating in their communities. And, and, and was grateful that the response was very positive. Uh, they were particularly excited that, that, this, that we were not seeking to take over anyone else's work, but seeking to walk alongside and support others who were, who were doing important work. Uh, that we approached this from a place of humility and, 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 and faithfulness. And, and that, uh, that we were you know, using the platform we were getting to make sure we highlight other people's good work and not just, I think there's a real tendency in, in any white institution um, to center ourselves. It's just sort of how white supremacy works. And uh, I've been very conscious to make sure that anytime um, you know, I do something that, that I'm inviting Natalie to come along with me. Um, she was not available today because we're doing another thing tonight. Uh, to, to speak on uh, the, how this connects to her and to ensure that we're highlighting the work of the, the, the organizations that we're walking alongside of. Uh, in terms of how the money, uh, so in a, how, how the money is being spent, uh, there's sort of two phases to this. The first is uh, direct disbursement of, of funds to organizations that are already doing good work. Some we have had longstanding relationships with already and have been supporting for some time. Others, uh, will be our new organizations or initiatives. You know, I, I, I appreciate uh, Tim saying that $500,000 is a lot of money. I think we can be honest and say that it's really not. Um, and so looking for places where, uh, you know, small organizations, community-led initiatives, they don't have to be nonprofits who are doing work in the justice arena uh, that we can support to help them get to the next phase uh, is, is kind of where we're looking to, to focus. Uh, but then the next phase is, you know, as we develop our advisory committee that met for the first time yesterday and our, our working group, that we begin to uh, work with organizations to help expand their, their power and reach, uh, recognizing that, you know, we not only as a congregation, we're small, uh, but we're connected to a lot of people and who have a lot of connections and wealth and resources. And so how can we inspire those people to to, to support all of the, the folks doing this work. So, so that's kind of where, where we're going. Uh, if, if at the end of five years, we've only done $500,000 worth of work, I would consider it a failure. Thank you for that. I think uh, uh, this conversation about money, we can get stuck on dollar amounts. I um, mean, talking with Sushama, um, in preparation for this, um, one of the things I, I think we said is that no amount of money is too small to begin the process, and no amount of money is large enough um, to truly make reparations. Um, but these dollars stand as symbols of where we are on, on the process. Um, so Sushama, to, to follow up on Marvin's question with you, um, sort of the student response. I'm curious what students have had to say about Princeton. And, and then uh, Chris has some questions for us from from those who are joining in the chat and other things. So Shushama, student response, and then we'll go to Chris and those questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important point, the amount of money, um, you know, small or large, that, that what has happened to, you know, Black people in this country and to minorities in this country from, you know, through slavery and through just, you know, any number of incidents and tragedies, um, it's not quantifiable. 
So I think that $500,000, $5,000, $28 million, I don't know that we, there's not an amount. And so I think that's a, a really important and valid point. Um, I think the perception from students and students were very specific about what they wanted. I think they were um, very eloquent and, and very strong in what they wanted. And I think it was disappointment because, you know, this is a billion dollar institution. The endowment is a billion dollars. So it, it can appear on some level that, oh, wow, you like you didn't do as much as we had hoped for. We had hoped for more. And um, and I think that students felt some disappointment, though, and it, though I think students that were leading during that time and who have since written and spoken about it did say it is a first step. And, and I agree and I agree um, wholeheartedly with that. Is it what you want? Is it the dream amount? No, but again, I don't know that there is one. And um, and, and it's a start. We're, we're moving in the right direction. It's definitely a start. I will say public support was very, you know, supportive. It's a, it's a nice amount of money to start talking about how to um, restore justice in some ways and to make amends. Yeah. One thing about um, public support and sort of the, the accolades that white churches have received for some of this, um, that can lead us, and I'm speaking to myself as a white person, to pat ourselves on the back and say what good work we're doing. Um, one of the things that, that Marvin and I um, have been aware of in, in our conversations with historically black congregations here in DC um, is that talking about reparations um, also brings up trauma and, and concern from our sisters and brothers, our siblings who are black. And so those of us who are white don't need to engage with this and just another white savior, look at me kind of approach, um, but to be aware that this is a painful conversation um, for, for so many people. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, Chris Davies is monitoring our, our chat and may want to contribute with some questions from others who have joined. Yes, I will first say that the resources that you all have been offering, the connections that are happening and the ways in which this conversation will inspire more conversation are already clear. It's clear to me that we're going to have to continue this conversation with around two in some capacity. So please keep a look out for that when it comes your way. Additionally, I want to lift up uh, one question so far from our Q&A with awareness that um, there are so many more beloveds of God. Um, so this is from Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart. She says, I am interested in hearing panelists say more about how reparations involve both, incre both increased investment in Black and non-Black people of color, work, lives, organization spaces, and divestment from death dealing white supremacist systems and institutions has anybody rescinded their finance have has anybody rescinded their their financial and or other commitments um, as a part of the work well that's a good question i um that goes to questions of endowment um and investments i don't know if bishop scarf or, or gray or sherry uh Sushama, i don't know if you can speak to princeton on that but thoughts about um taking money out of bad actors, if you will. Looks like silence there. I don't, I don't see the, uh, a word there, but the, that uh, great- I see Sh Sherry was gonna add in. Oh, Sherry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Well, I would say that that's a practice the Minnesota Conference has engaged in the past on other issues. We've divested around fossil fuels. We've divested in terms of um, groups and companies that oppress the Palestinians. So this is a practice that we have in our conference, but we have not applied it to this particular conversation as of yet. So I appreciate somebody raising that. My response okay. would be back to the same. We, 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 we also have a practice of, uh, of looking for investments that are, that are sound, socially sound. And, um, uh, and, and I, I made a note too of the word divestment um, because that did not appear in our resolution. So thank you very much for bringing that up. I, I would just add that, uh, you know, the Episcopal Church is developed in the process of developing some social justice screens for investment that churches can use, but that all of us invest every day um, in, in white supremacy in, in many ways. Uh, so what I encourage people to do is think about you know, when you're shopping for gifts, where do you buy from? Uh, Baltimore has a bunch of really great uh, black organizations and uh, black businesses that that uh, produce high quality items. Um, where do you go? Where do you stop for coffee? 
Uh, can you can you not go to Starbucks? Can you go to a black coffee shop in your in your community? Uh, who do you hire on your staff? Uh, all, all the different ways that we we invest money every day uh, is an opportunity for us to 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 change how we think about investing. Um, the other thing that we have to think about is is how do we live our lives. Uh, I did a, a video for our neighborhood at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that was about calling the police. Uh, we're an urban neighborhood on the margins of some pretty rough parts of Baltimore. And you know, even though we all put up Black Lives Matter signs when George Floyd was killed, we called the police 300 times last year on suspicious people, uh, not people committing a crime or breaking into something or anything, just people we didn't like the look of. And so, so you know, how do you invest your time? How do you engage? Yeah, exactly, you know, who's your primary care doctor, your accountant? Uh, you know, uh, I when I moved to Baltimore, my dentist is the closest dentist in my house, um, who happens to be a black woman, uh, and and that I sought to do it as much as I can in the local community, so that the that the way I'm investing is supporting development here in in our local community. Right. Uh, which brings me to one last thing for pastors is, um, you know, live by your church. Uh, if, if you're in an urban setting, you don't live out in the county, don't live in the suburbs. Uh, and if the church isn't paying you enough uh, to live there, shame them. Uh, you know, church leaders pay, pay your clergy enough to live uh, where they are effective in ministry. Thanks for uh, thanks for that word of shaming churches. I, I don't know <laughs> that uh, people may be rebelling in the chat board or, or dropping from the call, but no, to, to take this seriously at all levels of, of life is how we repair the breach, right? We do big sums of money when we are able. Um, we do small sums of money when we're able. We choose doctors um, and accountants. Uh, we buy our coffee at places that repair the breach as well. So thank you all for being a part of this conversation. Um, I think we need to do this again, maybe two or three hours for each of you. Um, but let me turn this back over to Chris Davies for some concluding words. Thank you, Chris. Oh, my goodness. Um, this, uh, there is so much here. There is so much work to do. I will say personally, and in result of, and in a conversation with the work that I do in the United Church of Christ, this is a conversation that will not end. This will be an ongoing, lifelong thing we are doing together. Um, having said that, if this conversation has inspired you, if you've learned something or picked something up, or you want to commit to doing this work in relationship with the United Church of Christ, please consider donating to the annual fund by texting UCC to 41444. And for those of you watching, I know that lots more opportunities about how to get involved have come up through the chat. They will also be posted eventually when we've cataloged, curated, and e emailed them all to all of you beneath the YouTube video in such a way that you can find what we're talking about, even if you're watching the recording. Additionally, I want to let you know what is upcoming. Um, first, I heard Kelly Brown Douglas's name come through. I do wanna let you know that we've had some conversations with, with her about being in conversation with us going forward. So you can look to that coming in the um, marketing emails that are coming as a result of you registering for this webinar. Additionally, coming up on Thursday is um, recovering Spiritual Practices of Enslaved Africans, which is a conversation about ritual with the Reverend Karen Georgia Thompson. Um, and next week, we are looking into more state of conversations and ways to be engaged together in our work towards building alongside God a just world for all people. So from here, and with so much to think about, act on, and work together on, um, I want to invite Reverend Marvin, are you, are you uh, willing to pray us out into the rest of our day? Yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you all for taking the time to be a part of this important conversation. Let us pray. Good and loving God, the God of justice, the God that calls us to repair the breach. May your spirit pour, continue to pour within us, oh dear God, the, the wisdom that we need to continue this important journey and conversation on reparations and the task, the challenging task that will be before us in acknowledging the story of the church, the work that needs to be done, no matter how difficult it may be, the trauma that even it may cause that we'll be faithful to you and keep our hand in your hand 
that you will lead us throughout this process. We thank you for these leaders who joined us today for this time to share the work that they are doing. May you continue, oh dear God, to guide them in this work. May the work that they do, oh dear God, bring glory to you. We thank you for our national offices and for their leadership in bringing us together every week for these important conversations that we can continue in the local level and continue, oh dear God, to be inspired to do the work of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in his name and spirit we pray and say, amen. Dear friends in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has enhanced your ministry or healed your soul in any way, please consider donating to support the annual fund of the United Church of Christ. Simply text UCC to 41444. Your support will help build more programs like this. We thank you for your support. Be blessed and be a blessing and know that you are not alone. We are holding you in prayer. Amen.